Welcome everybody to 52 Living Ideas. Tonight is Dao De Ching, and we'll be covering verses 67 and 68 to read your favorite version of these two verses. Go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat. Um, Penny. Um, Penny, I think you're still on mute. Evanique, followed by Evanique. Okay, now? Yes, there we go. Okay, sorry. <laughs> oh, no problem at all. No problem at all. Uh, this is Stephen Mitchell. Some say that my teaching is nonsense. Others call it lofty, but impractical. But to those who have locked inside themselves, this nonsense makes perfect sense. Or I mean, th those who have looked inside themselves. I was like, that doesn't make any sense. This nonsense makes perfect sense. And to those who put it into practice, this loftiness has roots that go deep. I have just three things to teach, simplicity, patience, compassion. These three are your greatest treasures, simple in actions and in thoughts. You return to the source of being, patient with both friends and enemies. You accord with the way things are, compassionate toward yourselves. You reconcile all beings in the world. Thank you, Penny. Uh, next up, we have Evanique. So this is chapter 67. This is from John R. Mabry, uh, God as Nature Sees God. Everyone says this Tao of mine is great and nebulous, so great, in fact, that it is too nebulous to be of any use. I have three treasures that I hold and cherish. One is called compassion. Another is called moderation. And the third is called daring not to compete. With compassion, one is able to be brave. With moderation, one has enough to be generous with others. Without competition, one is fit to lead. Nowadays, people don't bother with compassion, but just try to be brave. They scoff at moderation and find they have very little enough for themselves. They step on people in their rush to be first. This is death. One who is compassionate in warfare is victorious, and in defense, he holds fast. When heaven moves to save someone, it protects him through compassion. Thank you, Avanique. Uh, so next up, uh, we have Madeline, followed by Krishna. All right, this is the Jafu Fang and Jane English translation. 67. Everyone under heaven says that my Tao is great and beyond compare. Because it is great, it seems different. If it were not different, it would have vanished long ago. I have three treasures which I hold and keep. The first is mercy. The second is economy. The third is daring not to be ahead of others. From mercy comes courage. From economy comes generosity. From humility comes leadership. Nowadays, men shun mercy, but try to be brave. They abandon economy, but try to be generous. They do not believe in humility, <clears throat> but always try to be first. This is certain death. Mercy brings victory in battle and strength in defense. It is the means by which heaven saves and guards. Sorry, I was on mute there for a moment. Uh, so next up, we have David. Thank you, Madeline. I think you skipped Krishna. Oh, Krishna, yeah. Oh, Krishna, I'm sorry. Um, this is the Red Pine version. Um, 
The world calls me great, great but useless. It's because I am great, I am useless. If I were of use, I would have remained small. But I possess three treasures I treasure and uphold. First is compassion. Second is austerity. Third is reluctance to excel. Because I am compassionate, I can be valiant. Because I am austere, I can be extravagant. Because I am reluctant to excel, I can be chief of all tools. If I renounce compassion for valor, austerity for extravagance, humility for superiority, I would die. But compassion wins every battle and outlasts every attack. What heaven creates, but compassion protect. That's it. Thank you so much. Appreciate that, Krishna. And I apologize for uh, skipping over you there for a moment. Uh, David? See, I knew the dot was Krishna. Hey, I said, no. It Good call. Good call. <laughs> so we do the Herman Old. Uh, All the world declares that the Tao of which we speak may be supreme, but nevertheless, it baffles definition. Indeed, it is because it is supreme that it baffles definition. If it had been definable, it would have long since become as negligible as the conventions. These are my three treasures, which I prize and protect. The first is compassion. The second is moderation. The third is not to attempt to be the first among men. If you are compassionate, you can be truly brave. If you are moderate, you can be truly generous. If you do not attempt to be the first among men, you can become the chief of ministers. But nowadays, if you are brave, it is at the expense of compassion. If you are generous, it is at the expense of moderation. If you lead, it is at the expense of humility. And this is death. For he who fights with compassion will conquer. He who defends with compassion will hold fast. Heaven will save him and protect him with compassion. Thank you, David. Now, which version again was that? That's the uh, Herman Uld. Okay, thank you. So I have Laura followed by Margarita. I was thinking I was not in the right place until Madeline read hers, which is my, uh, stop. Um, oh wait, a second. Yeah, I'm get her out of here. I'm trying to do something. Uh, yeah. Why don't we come back to Laura? All right, um, Are you ready? Are yeah. you ready? Okay. She's now I thought I was in the wrong place till Madeline read hers. And it's pretty much ver verbatim to mine, which is loud so loud so. Um, so I don't think I need to read it um, again because of that. So okay. I pass, but I just wanted to, to tell you who mine was the verse of. Okay. Oh, uh, and who is it? Lao Tzu. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, um, Margarita, you're next. So I will read in Bahasa. Uh, semua orang di dunia mengatakan bahwa Tao terlalu besar, sehingga mereka tidak dapat menyesuaikan dirinya. Justru dari besarnya, maka tak dapat menyesuaikan diri. Bila ada yang dapat menyesuaikan diri, namun tidak sepenuhnya, hanya sebagian kecil saja. Aku memiliki tiga mustika. Pertama, molas kasih. Kedua, sederhana. Ketiga, kerendahan hati. Dengan sifat yang penuh belas kasih, maka ia menjadi berani. Dengan berlaku sederhana, maka ia menjadi murah hati. Dengan tidak ingin mendahului dunia, maka ia menjadi besar dan memiliki kendali. Barang siapa berani namun tanpa belas kasih, atau murah hati tanpa kendali, atau mengendalikan saja, akan fatal. Siapa yang menggunakan belas kasih dalam peperangan akan menang. Langit akan memberikan karunia dan akan melindungi dengan belas kasihnya. 
Thank you. Thank you, it's you Margarita. Similar with, with, uh, with other translation. Thank you so much. It's always nice to hear uh, it read in Bahasa. Um, so uh, if there is no one else that would like to read their favorite version of verse 67, um, I'm going to go ahead and read the Ursula Le Guin version. And uh, it is titled Three Treasures. Everybody says my way is great, but improbable. All greatness is improbable. What's probable is tedious and petty. I have three treasures. I keep them, I keep and treasure them. The first, mercy. The second, moderation. The third, modesty. If you're merciful, you can be brave. If you're moderate, you can be generous. And if you don't presume to lead, you can lead the high and mighty. But to be brave without compassion or generous without self-restraint or to take lead or to take the lead is fatal. Compassion wins the battle and holds the fort. It is the bulwark of it's a bulwark set around those heavens heaven helps. So uh, with that, I will turn it over to uh, Aman. Yeah. Um, I will share the version that Jason and I have put together. Um, I will make a couple of edits as I read, but you will be able to see why those edits are there. Um, chapter 67, The Three Jewels. Everyone in the world says my Tao teaching is too great to describe. It is only because of its greatness that it is indescribable. If it were described, it would be insignificant after a while. I have three treasures, love, prudence, and daring not to be first in the world. Through love, one can have courage. Through prudence, one can reach widely. Through Daring not to be first in the world, one can take the lead. If one is courageous without love, reaches widely without patience, prudence, rushes in front without being willing to stay behind, he is surely in danger. If one uses love to fight, he will win. To defend, he can guard strongly. When heaven wants to save someone, heaven will use love to protect him couple of things. One, as you can see, Jason was asking about this choice of terms for sambao. Um, sambao is often translated as <clears throat> three treasures. He asked if three refu refuges was accurate, but this word bao is the qu word in question. And earlier in his translation, I believe it was chapter... 50 something. Um, he opted to translate the term Bao into jewels. And so that was actually what I had offered. Um, there's a little glitch in the grammar, daring instead of dares. But then there's this word, Xiao, which he translates as describe. And that's perfectly acceptable. Um, one thing I do want to mention about it, though, is that there's wordplay here that is lost in translation. And it has to do with the tao, da, and bu, shao. More literally to translate this, everyone in the world, all under heaven, say my dao is great. Da is great or big. This then reads, but it is not shao. Shao means to resemble or match or be comparable to, but tonally, it's there are two ways to pronounce it. And if you were to only hear this, then shao could be easily misinterpreted as small. And that's, if it were heard that way, it would read something like, everyone in the world says my Tao is great but it is not small. 
it is only because it is great that it is not small. If it were small, it would be insignificant after a while. That's how shall as a wordplay would actually work into this. But then when you turn around, you realize, oh, it's not actually saying small, it's saying matching or resembling or describable or comparable. Um, so I tried to bring that out with a suggestion of, um, oh, what was it I suggested? Uh, uh, portioned, because portioned is a word that can mean to match or compare or describe, but it also has a connotation of size, which is something that's lost here. Um, I don't think Jason went for it, but these are his translations, not mine. The last thing I would say about this is the importance of daring not to go first before the world. This idea of being daring to do something was reiterated earlier in chapter 60. Five, I want to say. Um, was that where it is? And we talked about this a little bit then about daring to let others fail, mm -hmm. daring to do nothing. I was looking for it, but I'm not going to find. Oh, wait, is that right? Yeah. He dares not to interfere. Same word. Um, and so this idea of it being an act of daring to not interfere or to not go first before the world, I think are reiterations of, of each other that are meant to be brought out in this chapter. Um, and a final word, since we'll go to comments next, and I'll just get mine in quickly. The Sambao or three treasures is, are the locus of Taoist ethics. These three treasures, compassionate love, uh, parsimony, prudence, wu wei, and daring, being daring enough not to put yourself first before others. These are the three sort of lodestones that a good Taoist follows in order to know that they're doing the right thing, generally speaking. And there. Thank you very much, Amon. Uh, thank you for your comments, as always, and the explanation on the translation. Um, now, everyone, uh, go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat. If I could, please, if I could uh, real quick. Absolutely, Kevin, please do. Kevin is bringing up a, a point thank about you. that yeah. word, too. Okay. Yes, which Jason's translating as love. And I, too, actually opted for compassion as a suggestion. Um, he described it in our correspondence as understanding it as love in the more Christian sense of uh, apogee, uh, sort of a universal love for all. And again, like I said, his translation, but I wanted to cue Kevin in before he got at it, that yes, I, I zeroed in on that as well and discussed it with him. Thank you for that. I'm looking at some of the other translations just to see what they have. But um, now it's time uh, for your takeaways. If everybody could go ahead and type exclamation point in the chat uh, to share your takeaways about number 67. I think Kevin's got an exclamation point there oh, in front. He, oh, he did have one in front. Okay. Oh, is that, and I have, okay. Uh, yes, I have Madeline. Is it, or it's actually Madeline, I believe. No, I, I think Amon is right. I think Kevin had an exclamation point in front of the okay. character. Yeah, Madeline, uh, you kind of go ahead if you want. Oh, he did. Okay, I could barely okay. see it there. Go ahead, Kevin. I'm sorry. I, yeah. I thought I thought it was part of the. Uh, forgive me. Yes, yeah, thank you. Uh, I'm on right away. Catch that word. I would say, yeah, it's compassion, 
Mer and Madeline Translacy of Mercy, that's close to my understanding. It allow a little bit too, I would say great to put it here. If we, if we write it, maybe it's great to put it here, but if based uh, the tags, I would use uh, Mercy is nice too. For example, in modern days, we use, um, if we use love, it's I. Basically, parents love the kids, like uh, the big uh, say, stay, sage, love uh, ordinary people, rulers love their people. If we can from that too. Then the second one, yeah, it's the save and uh, based on the translation, I guess. Uh, uh, yeah, love in the uh, prudence. Yeah, and the third one is a uh, third, uh, third uh, treasure about uh, uh, dare not to be first in the world. That's, uh, yeah, make make people think. I get, would get people opinion about that. Normally we get a champion, get a first, compete. No one is value this, go to second. Even, yeah, thank you. I want to come back to that um, in a moment, uh, this idea of competing uh, in this context uh, specifically. But uh, Madeline, followed by Katie. OK, uh, well, Mon just answered uh, one of my questions <laughs> by putting it in chat, which was about the character that the top part means now and the lower part means heart. Um, so I guess like the, the, the present heart. Uh, this, this poem seemed to be written in a somewhat different voice than some of the others. Uh, it's written very strongly in the first person. Mm -hmm. And I don't really recall seeing the phrase my Tao um, in any of the others or sentences starting with I. And I'm wondering um, what anyone has to say about that. Um, why don't we let Aman go ahead and answer that, Katie, and we'll come to you next. Thank you. So the two characters in question right here, Wu Dao, it can, they literally translate Wu as my, I, mine, um, any self-referential first-person pronoun, and Dao. And here, it is a question of whether or not one thinks that Lao Tzu is trying to take ownership of the Tao, capital T, capital T. Um, and he starts by saying, people say, my Tao is great, but it is not describable. It is not small. It is not comparable. Um, it's almost a self-effacing. You call this my Tao. It's not mine. It, 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 people say it's my Tao, but it is the Tao. That, that's how I understand this sentence as an indication that ascribing it to him is an incorrect thing. But describing the Tao is doable. However, yeah, it is pretty great because it's not small. Um, all of that is sort of together in that uh, first sentence. Thank you, Amon. Uh, next up, we have Katie. Yeah, I see. I see the recurring theme of passive leadership. I think I like the way you described it another week, Joe, by saying it like that versus active leadership, where like the leader makes the first step out there and says this. You know, this is gives a speech or says this is this is where we want to be going and then people follow the leader so i think this is it's a little more the uh, a passive thank you katie uh next up we have david i i guess i wanted to dig in a, sort of to this esoteric issue of chinese um i mean it was very Curious about the, the comment from Amon. Is it, and, and I guess Kevin and firstly Jason's idea, 
is it at all possible that, because you said that that character in front of Dao is, is the a personal pronoun. Is it at all possible to read that as possessive for the Dao itself as opposed to the speaker? Like the, the, the Dao's virtue, the Dao, like the Dao is speaking instead of I, Lao Tzu is Dao. I mean, is it possible that it's self-referential for the second character? I don't know enough Chinese that that's even grammatically correct. I'm just, could, is it possible for it to be the pronoun of the Dao itself? I'm not okay. ignoring you. I'm actually thinking about that as a possible way of reading it. Um, it's kind of like our universe, our right, God. exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, it would be an odd choice. Um, the components of war are a hand and a halberd, or a pole arm of some kind, and um, that is a fairly, I hesitate to say it this way almost, but a, an almost militaristic way of um, expressing the self. Uh, and I don't think it's a mistake that it's being done that way. W when we get into the next chapter, you'll see there's a lot of militaristic illusion. And I think it, uh, I do think it's more self-negating as in this is bigger than mine. This is bigger than I. Um, but it could, I could see an interpretation of speaking on behalf of the Tao, um, though that would be very out of keeping with most of the tone and most of the um, rest of the text. But no, it's not grammatically impossible based on the Chinese. Hey, thanks. Uh, thank you, Amon, and thank you, David, for the question. Um, next up, we have Penny. I just, um, I really like this poem. It seems that um, he summarized a lot of the philosophy of the Tao so simply. And in the beginning, you know, saying that people don't understand it, but basically, you know, he has three things to teach you know, compassion, economy, austerity, you know, humility, reluctance to excel. I just, it, I, I just find it very beautiful that basically if, if one follows these where, you know, you're thinking of other people, you're, you're not trying to hog more resources in the world than you should have, you know, but just to use what you need and that you and don't try to be first. That that that's a that is a, a recipe for being a great leader and a great person with just those simple acts. So I just thought it was very very beautiful and touching. Uh, I I agree with you um, wholeheartedly. I mean, I one of the things that I've thought about with this particular verse. Um, was some of the connections that were made with the idea of something like compassion. Uh, so that the idea that uh, to be brave in my version that I had read was to be brave without compassion or generous without self-restraint or to take the lead uh, is fatal. And, you know, just to seeing how these two interact with one another. And I want to come to that after everybody's had a chance maybe to comment. Uh, just get their thoughts on that. Maybe get a mind's thoughts on that. Um, so next up, uh, we have Marco, followed by Kevin. Um, yeah, I really like um, it's uh, you know the where it says that it's daring not to be ahead of others, and it's sort of like courageous and sort of brave to do so, and um, it's sort of brave to be um, compassionate and it's sort of like, yeah, just like, you know, it maybe like the West is more um, sort of, um, you know, to be compassionate is like not manly or anything like that, but 
Um, but yeah, um, that's just that it's sort of like brave to be compassionate. So that's. Yeah, I, that was partially my takeaway too. But um, also, if you're thinking about it in terms of uh, someone that's in, in the act of uh, actually going out and um, maybe if they're engaging with in combat, uh, that why that may be important, um, you know, that uh, that compassion actually has a really a role in conflict uh, at this time. And especially with so many warring states, that's kind of what a, my, that's where my thoughts went. Um, the importance of compassion in conflict as a way of kind of de-escalating it, so to speak. Um, even, even with your enemy is to show some mercy. Uh, but anyway, uh, so next up we have Kevin followed by Margarita, then followed by Madeline. Thank you, Joe. I got a two. One is a question about for myself, even. From the war of the Chinese code, uh, uh, this is so modern. We use the war. But in the old days, that uh, 2,000 years ago, use this word as self or ours. I doubt that time because since Confucius or later on, people so many ways describe the self. So that time use exactly this day. That, that's a question from my, I, I maybe Amon got more thought about that. Second one, I want to share. If you change the, these three treasures, use modern practice or by nature, for example, I would say first one, by rule, instead of mercy. Second one um, would be consume, spend, instead of prudence. Third one would be be the first, not a second. Why is it in nature? If you think about the, this monopoly or every industry, the number one always occupy a majority, 70 to 80% of a market, or uh, our human our resource, the 10%, top of 1%. It's by nature. Can a human being we believe because we believe it is going to change the way we're doing? Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you, Kevin. Um, Margarita. Yes, I, I also like this chapter. Uh, one, I realized that in Bahasa, it was only the first sentence, it's only translated as Tao. But in three other translations, I hear it's my Tao. So I think this is quite unique as if like this is an invitation to reflect. Where are you? What you hold to believe? What is Tao to you? Uh, as Amon say, my Tao is smaller. Tao is larger, is bigger than what uh, we have in our mind. Even our virtue that we consider like these three jewels, we need to reflect on it. What is it exactly and how we should express it? and how we see ourselves, we, we position ourselves in the greater scheme from the heaven, how the universe works. So this is not just explicitly saying three jewels, but I think it's also invite us to reflect of what are our jewels and how should we understand our jewel, our Tao, which is minute compared to the bigger Tao. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Margarita. Um, so next up we have Madeline, that was beautiful. Well, I'm looking at um, <clears throat> the uh, final couplet in the poem, because at the beginning, the word my, as hand plus halberd, a uh, woe. And then at the very end, we have battle and strength and defense and uh, mercy being the means by which heaven saves and guards, which is in my translation. So it kind of looks as if um, thematically uh, the, that specific word for my may have been chosen because it really complemented what's at the end of the poem. The imagery of uh, victory in battle and strength and defense 
So it's not just my my hand with the halberd, uh, but it's the the present heart that's bringing that. Interesting. And I'm actually looking at your version right now. Um, I want to come back to these three, but Ebony, go ahead. You can. I think Krishna was next. Was it? Oh, yes, you were. Sorry about that. Krishna, please forgive me. Okay. Um, I, I want to question um, a, um, a philosophical difference between Buddhism and Taoism. Mm. Uh, Buddhism in general and Zen Buddhism in particular say that the two important virtues are compassion and wisdom. They're like the two word wings of a bird. But in um, here, he's, he's saying instead of um, uh, wisdom, he's saying humility and uh, austerity. And they seem, um, they don't seem to add up to wisdom. So it isn't quite homologous. I don't know what it means. <laughs> Could it be um, to whom he was providing advice to? would maybe be a, uh, a reason for that. I mean, preaching humility and austerity to someone uh, in charge, a prince, someone along those lines uh, would make more sense than maybe, not wouldn't make more sense, but would, would be something that you would say to somebody that had enough uh, versus, uh, you know, versus somebody that it's as a general rule we're looking for compassion and wisdom from pretty much everyone. We, we don't know what his audience was. I, I, I don't think it's ever stated. Um, and it's a pretty general declaration of what our, it says the three jewels. I mean, it, it right. seems to be very central to um, the philosophy. Uh, so. Thank you, Krishna. Uh, next up, uh, we have uh, Evanique. Now, I have a question on uh, when people were talking about our Tao or my Tao compared to the larger Tao, is it talking about, like we talk in other meetups about the sensor or the God in you? So I'm just wondering, is, is it referring to that? I don't believe so, but I'm going to defer to Amon on that particular question. Yeah, I I can't definitively say, but no, I do not think that it is um, the a sort of Taoist namaste, as it were. Um, I do think it that as much as it's a tonal change of hearing the expression "my Tao" or there's more than one way to interpret it. Um, one of the other things to remember is that the word Tao could actually mean just a teaching or a saying. It, it need not always refer to the great Tao. And I think those two things are significant here because it could be a way of him expressing, people say my teaching is great. <clears throat> that is something that possibly somebody would take more ownership of, but he's using the word Tao for it. And that is what the subject of the entire text is ostensibly about. And so I think there's also that people say that portion that removes him from it, that it's not mine. I don't own this. And even if people say it in terms of my teaching, I'm not the one who created this curriculum. This is out there. This exists in the world. I've just observed it. And here are the three treasures that allowed me to better observe it. Thank you for that, Amon. Uh, next up, uh, we have JJ, followed by Kevin. Yeah, hi. Um, so basically, um, when I, I was reminded of um, the Hebrew Kabbalah when I um, 
with listening to the the comments about the virtues um, and um, it seems that the the text is trying to bring in subtlety to this path of right action of right being and so on um it is it, comparing um this various virtues and the balance of them to to attain balance um to in a subtle way so that when one acquires a certain virtue realizes that um maybe another virtue might be diminished should be diminished so all the ingredients um, all the weights are to be positioned in certain ways to to create the perfect balance. That was what came to mind. Thank you, JJ. Uh, next up, I have Kevin. Just to follow up and say about the uh, what's the word? Dao, my dao. Um, this though, though it's also going that time being, I would say people know loads, uh, know this person and they, they will criticize. What's the though? Like a new term come up. I cannot say it here, explain it here. Whatever you say, it is specific. He's about the uh, first word uh, among, about the show. Any basic object or something you can see it, it become compared to Dao, it's a small. So that's you could say it's invisible. That's that's how that's like my uh embrace I call it Dao. So they use one chapter thing. I don't know the term, so I make the term called it Dao. So that's a though it's it's not like yeah we cannot say it we cannot explain if you explain it's not eternal though the first chapter saying that right here is it it exists there like a man said so we are smaller though if you use people uh, we need to follow those we try to pursue it and the, when you hear the trick you find you think I got a though actually you still need further more. If you, from deeper, from the mathematic way, think about it like every paradox, like every time you divide by two, divide by two, it's a forever, go to small. Or multiple, but like the bigger, the same thing. And, uh, okay, I'm gonna pause here, thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Um... So I don't see any other comments. Um, so maybe I'll just uh, put a question out there uh, really quick. Oh, go ahead, Laura. You're on mute, Laura. This might've been discussed and I might've gone, might've been bypassed. I slept for 14 hours tonight. So I'm a little bit, <laughs> might be just waking up. So excuse me. Um, for the first time, these translations seem so far apart, you know, so very different in nature. Most of the other ones, you know, plus or minus a few words here and there were very similar. And these were so different. That's why I said, I thought when I found myself hitting upon Madeline, it was like the first time I touched ground on these because they were so different. Does anybody feel that way as well? Now, I, I think that there, there was significant variation uh, in the in the verses that when I looked at the side by side translations. So if I looked at the Stephen Mitchell versus uh, the Jia Fufang uh, or even um, the uh, J.H. McDonald's uh, compared to uh, to uh, the Jim Clatfelters uh, and even uh, when I was comparing it with um, with Jason's translation as well. So there was quite a bit of variation and, and um, uh, I'll let Amon to uh, comment on why that may be. Uh, and even the fact that Madeline's translation and mine were the same when I'm sure there were many years in between. I really sense. liked Madeline's translation and it's one that I really thought was very clear in right. linking, summing, uh, linking things like uh, 
you know, uh, being merciful and being and being courageous or brave, um, you know, to uh, the importance of moderation and 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 gener and being generous, uh, and and uh, the other was uh, how being humble and leadership are one and one together. Yeah. I kind of see that, but I would like to explore maybe a little bit more what people thought about the idea of um of uh moderation and generosity uh so but let's uh, let maybe a mon comment really briefly uh as to maybe he can provide a better answer for your question well <clears throat> the first the um change in tone we're wrapping up towards the end of the of the text and the subject that's being discussed again and again in different ways is conflict is how to navigate negotiate deal with address conflict which was a hot topic as of the time this is contemporaneous with sun tzu's art of war which is an entire text devoted to thinking of everything in terms of warfare of struggle um <clears throat> and then Lao Tzu offers, you know, through compassionate love, one can have courage. Through parsimonious austerity, one is able to reach wide. By not daring to be first in the world, you will be able to take the lead. And then he goes with the, you know, if not, then if you're courageous, but not with love, with compassionate love. If you attempt to reach widely in the world, but you are not prudently, parsimoniously austere, and if you rush out there ahead of everyone, you're surely in danger. <clears throat> These are the lived experiences, I think, of a lot of the states that they observed around them, the ones who rose up and said we have food for everyone come to our country and we will feed you and then ran out because they weren't austere or when they went and invaded another country without compassion and then just did a scorched earth sort of policy or when they propped themselves up as so big and so bad as to not be you know worth attacking and wound up being subsumed by somebody one of their neighbors who said these guys are getting too big for their britches all of those sort of abject lessons would have been in the world around them and Lao Tzu's being very explicit in this chapter about what the perils are of doing these things without the proper preparation and then there is that last those last two lines one who uses compassionate love to fight will win to defend he can guard strongly when and that is actually not a foreign concept i think to most anybody who's had a military experience if you talk to a gi if you talk to somebody who's actually experienced warfare most of them say i'm not there for the principle i'm not fighting for you know some i'm fighting for the person next to me because i care about them my you know fraternal feelings towards my fellow soldier towards the person who i am right next to is what really motivates most people to go out and you know engage in warfare telling this to a leader it would be somewhat revolutionary, but it would also be something that they could simply, you know, take a tally of their soldiers and probably find out. These are some of the reasons for the change in tone, but it's also where an ethic is just an ethic, a moral compass is just a moral compass until rubber meets the road, until you really have to actually apply it it's that sort of everyone's got a philosophy until they're in a foxhole or as Mike Tyson said, everybody's got a plan until they get punched. Um, until you're actually 
putting this in the crucible, you don't know that it's real. And I think the change in tone here is exactly that, that this is going to go into the crucible of the warring states. It's real. You can look around you and see it. You don't just have to take my word for it. It's not my doubt. It's the way it actually is out there. That was beautifully said. I mean, and if you even take the the idea of what you're talking about, that when you're going to war, that it's not necessarily for uh, the, the principle of the matter. It's for the person that's actually next to you. Uh, and this and this idea of how that relates to um, our relationships to people. Uh, every organization that I worked in, most of them have been bureaucratic. Uh, and I found that that to be true. I work more for the person next to me. Uh, or my teammates, or the person that's the the happens to be the leader, then I do the organization itself, uh, and and I think that there's a direct relationship there. Um, that was beautifully articulated. Thank you, Amon. Uh, and as far as leadership is concerned, that is an invaluable thing to recognize. You know, when you're talking about what people really care about. Uh, they care about each other. Um, so I think that that's a very powerful point and, and I'm very happy you pointed that out. So we have a couple of people waiting in line. Um, uh, Laura, did you want to follow up really briefly? Yeah, if you watch the movies with warfare, they're always fighting for the person at home. Yes, the person that they love. Uh, you know, it, it, it's in that same principle. Maybe yeah. even the person I not think next I want to, to them. Say that it extends beyond the individual next to them, but uh, it extends to their people that they've left behind, and that they're fighting for their country as well, for their countrymen. And that it's invaluable for a leader to actually understand, in order for them to actually motivate people. And that's any good leader recognizes that and actually. Um, uh, aligns their values uh, to where you know they're taking care of the people that work underneath them, or the the values in this case of, of their soldiers, um, and make sure they remember as to why they're there in the first place. Well, I think that that's embedded also in this in these poems. Yes. Thank you. Uh, so next up, uh, I have. Um, Katie, followed by Margarita. Um, yeah, so I was going to speak to your moderation and generosity a little, speak a little bit more to what I thought I was saying at first. It, it didn't make sense to me because I was thinking, well, what are they trying to say? Are they getting to like, is there such a thing as too much generosity? But I think they're trying to say like, 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 um, also, like, well, you can see this in every day, too. It's like, don't overgive, like, because then you won't be able to give to a lot of people. You'll be so, like, overspent and, like, start to become resentful. But I think it's also, like, ties in with this passive leadership. It's not, you're not living other people's lives for them. You're just, you know, helping. It's a little bit more passive and teaching and helping. And it's not a, you know, do things for them kind of that that's kind of how I took the moderation of generosity it's like moderating your efforts so you don't burn out so you can keep helping lots of people and do it just a little bit so it doesn't overdo it in their lives yeah you know that was something that I found to be interesting myself is that you can actually overdo anything uh, including generosity um, so that moderation is something that is actually uh it, it's it's it'll actually it's beneficial in the long run to anybody if you continually give and give and give that um yes it's the then you you actually are able, you know you're taking away from yourself and basically your ability to give in the future so it's the old saying of you know uh you have to save yourself if you're on the airline, put the mask on yourself first so that you can then save other people. Um, so with that, actually, Douglas, uh, Margarita, I, can, I'm gonna go to Douglas first and, um, and uh, uh, then I'll come back to you.
and then I'll come back to Laura. Go ahead, Douglas. Douglas, if you're talking, you're on mute. Oh, oh is not there? Maybe he's not there. Uh, yeah, I got there you go. now. Okay, there you go. Okay, I didn't know because, okay. Yeah, and I'll, I think it's self-love, and I say if the person sees the speck in his own eye, okay, that when he's ruling for, for his people, because he's got a lot of responsibility, and if he doesn't see that speck, uh, what, it, what it is, that's in him. How is he going to get it out to his people? Okay, the only way he's going to get what he has, he has to understand what 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 he himself is going through from the people and what you know that he has that he has to rule. So when he knows what he's doing, okay, through understanding what what is happening, if he doesn't understand, then he's in trouble. Thank you, Douglas. Uh, so next up. Uh, we have Margarita followed by Laura. Yeah. Um, I have a question. Mm -hmm. But first, uh, this is my understanding. For the first part, I think it's more like a teacher saying, this is my Tao. I shape it with three jewels. But I understand this is only a part of the, the greater Tao. And while the, I think it's quite interesting for the last two sentences, uh, like men will do in, in war, if you do uh, love, he will have victory. He will reach for hit victory. However, I, this is my question to Amon, perhaps or other people can answer. The heaven has its own principle, that is love. So, we human have this three jewel that can help us to benefit to develop this understanding about Tao, but but it seems like heaven has its own way, which is probably love. That is the way it uh, the, 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 its main principle. Is that correct? How to understand this? Or yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll defer to Ma. I'll, I'll take a crack at interpreting this. Um, I think one way, though I won't say it is the way to understand this, is as an allusion to the mandate of heaven. It, when heaven wants to save someone, it will use love. When a leader is worthy of retaining the right to lead, heaven bestows love within that leader and therefore and love for that leader and therefore they are allowed to continue to lead i think that's kind of the illusion that's being made in that last sentence and i think the inverse is implied when your people begin hating you and or when you find yourself being resentful towards them heaven's not going to protect you you're not going to retain that mandate you're going to be usurped that that's kind of the implicit threat there um, that's the most direct way for me to understand it, though I do believe there are other ways to interpret it in more allegorical terms and or just more personalized terms that if you are a bitter, spiteful person and or you see that reflected in the people around you, you're probably not long for this world. It, it's just the world is not going to go out of its way to cooperate with you. Um, I think that is another way of understanding it. Again, this is one where traditionally these are teachings to a princeling, but they absolutely have bearing on anyone's life when they think about managing their own affairs, managing their own life in a successful, harmonious easier way you we've all met somebody who uh just quarrels with everyone around them and everything becomes about their latest quarrel their latest squabble or fight um they're not pleasant people and <laughs> they usually find that they suffer attrition from those in their lives around them they they just don't want to be around them um, 
this would be a, a, especially true if you were in a position of leadership. Um, heaven here is sort of the heavenly order of the celestial realm you see above your head at night. It, it's not much more ethereal than that. I, yes, I, I, you know, I, I completely agree with that wholeheartedly. I mean, you know, if you've ever really been around someone who is, you know, bitter or resentful in general, they pretty much suck the life out of you and in a room. It's, it's, it's quite horrible. But um, the other aspect of this is the, even if you're, we can apply it to all levels, but um, one of the things in reading, one of my favorite books to read is uh, Marcus Aurelius's Meditations. And I think I've mentioned this here in the past, uh, in the book one, he highlights all the, um, all the wonderful things in certain people that, they, they, that they've given him, demonstrated during their lives. And it's extreme gratitude. Uh, so I think that this, and Cicero himself said, gratitude is the mother of all virtues, because essentially you're showing gratitude to the people around you um, that, that then um, will, you know, essentially allow you to engage with people and have healthy relationships and to lead um, because if you're an ingrate, then nobody's going to want to be around you. Uh, you're not even really concerned about what other people are doing uh, and the sacrifices that they're making. Uh, one of the other things that are very, I always found to be very interesting about Marcus Aurelius is that um, he was always on the front lines with his you know, soldiers. Uh, whereas uh, his son, Commodus, who was a terrible leader, was not. So he was, it was the first thing he actually retreated. He was scared of no, numerous things. Uh, but nonetheless, I, I just think that this uh, idea of how love and leadership and gratitude and all these things kind of come together uh, is uh, um, it's, uh, it's, it's evident and it's very powerful, even on a micro level as well as when you're talking about leaders. And I add just a little bit because oh, this add a lot. <laughs> kind of reminds me of Paul's uh, out of faith, love, hope, faith and love. <laughs> love faith, hope and love. Love. Yeah. love, yes. So as if like this is a, a, a cue, you know, heaven works with this way, you know, even though that person you consider them as enemy, but if heaven protects this person, by love, he will sustain. So, uh, so this is also some kind of, even though we try to mold our understanding with these three jewels, however, there is this principle, which is higher than human heaven, that is according to love. So even though we already reflect on our three virtues, three jewels, nevertheless, there's this something beyond that, that's higher, that is love. Thank you. Yeah, and reading one version of Dante, um, when he uh, is um, in um, heaven, uh, essentially he's explaining love, uh, and he said to to know God is to love Him. So it's like something way beyond yourself. Um, yeah, so that was a, that's also faith, hope, and love, as far as those theological uh, virtues as well. Um, are there any other comments uh, that I think there was somebody after you, Margarita, if I don't, if I remember correctly. Um, no, I, I don't see actually any exclamation points. So, uh, okay, I think um, we can move on to uh, number 68. It's a little bit, most of the versions that I saw are a bit shorter. Um, <laughs> but um, so uh, if you could type exclamation point um, to read your favorite uh, verse in the chat and 
first up, we have, and I'm always grateful for this, Penny. All right. I'm going to read J.H. MacDonald, um, okay. 68. The best warriors do not use violence. The best generals do not destroy indiscriminately. The best tacticians try to avoid confrontation. The best leaders become servants of their people. This is called the virtue of non-competition. This is called the power to manage others. This is called attaining harmony with the heavens. Thank you very much, Penny. Um, really quickly, I'm just gonna read uh, just a line from Ursula Le Guin. Uh, when she was writing about chapter 67, not to bring us back, but uh, she has uh, some notes that she had at the end of 67. And the only reason I'll read it is because it's in relation to 68. Uh, the first two verses of this chapter are a, are a joy to me. That was for verse 67. The three final verses are closely connected in thought to the next, to the next two chapters which may be read as a single meditation on mercy, moderation, and modesty, and the use of strength on victory and defeat. So just something to keep in mind uh, going, in, going uh, through number 68 and 69. Uh, next up, we have uh, Evanique, followed by Laura. <clears throat> This is 68. This is a John R. Maverick translation. God is nature sees God. Uh, the best soldier is not violent. The best fighter is not driven by anger. The true conqueror wins without confrontation. The best employer is humble before his employees. I say there is much good in not competing. I call it using the power of the people. This is known as being in tune with heaven like the sages of old. Thank you, Avanique. Um, next up, uh, we have Laura followed by David. Uh, you have to unmute, Laura. Um, as I'm looking at this, there are several verses, and each one of the verses is translated by someone else, and I don't know how you want me to do this, uh, so I'm not sure. Um, is there uh, a specific person that you, whose translation you'd prefer, like you I usually prefer? None of the, I don't know any of these um, people. They're never, don't appear to be any ones among the group of people that we hear either. Um, and as I peruse these, I can't, I can't tell you which one I would like the most. Um, so I don't know what to do here. Okay. So why don't you uh, just um, go back on mute. I can a random one. Um, well, why don't you go back on mute and take a look at one that you think that speaks to you and we'll come back to you. Uh, okay. All right. I'll All right. Do it. So we'll go to David first and then uh, we'll go from there. Thanks. Um, so actually, I'll, if this is short, let me do two because it's really interesting translations. I mean, first, the thing in English, which I know some others really like, you too, is <clears throat> so for that one, chapter 68 um, a good soldier is not violent, a good fighter is not angry. A good winner is not vengeful. A good employer is humble. This is known as the virtue of not striving. This is known as ability to deal with people. This since ancient times has been known as the ultimate unity with heaven. Now what's interesting is with the old, I mean, I'll be curious what Jason's translation is like is it's, it's, it's I mean, that would seem to be, and a lot of what I've, we've heard has been sort of very regular in those first lines. And this one doesn't have the unity in the first lines, which just surprised me. <clears throat> so Herman Old, the captain who is most accomplished does not make a display of warlike zeal. The best fighter is not angry. He who is most capable of conquering does not engage the enemy. 
He who is most capable of using men places himself in a position inferior to them. This may be called the virtue of non-striving, the power to use men. It is to work in consort with heaven itself and attain the highest ideal of the ancients. So just thank you, uh, David. Very, thank you. very different structure of all of it. So that is very different. Um, there's a lot of variation on this too, on the multiple translations uh, page that I was actually on. Uh, so Laura, uh, did you find one that has, or let me see if there's anybody else that, uh, Margarita, please. I use bahasa. Um, prajurit bijaksana tidak tergesa-gesa. Prajurit berani tidak beringasan. Pemenang memimpin tanpa berkompetisi. Majikan pandai memakai orang dengan sikap rendah hati. Inilah yang disebut kebajikan dari tidak berbuat. Inilah yang disebut dapat mengelola energi. Inilah yang pada zaman dulu disebut kesempurnaan yang seimbang dengan langit. Thank you, Margarita. Um, so, Laura, have you found? Actually, why don't I go ahead and read Ursula Le Guin's uh, really quickly, and then uh, we'll come back to you. Heaven's lead. The best captain doesn't rush in front. The fiercest fighter doesn't bluster. The big winner isn't competing. The best boss takes a low footing. This is the power of non-competition. This is the right use of ability to follow heaven's lead has always been the best way. So uh, with that, I will, um, oh, Madeline, most welcomed uh, translum. Yes, um, well, I have the same translation as David, uh, the Fung in English. And I just wanted to say uh, that for those of you who only hear that translation um, read out loud during meetups or you read the words online, the book has really stunningly beautiful photography in it, black and white photography. And uh, so the facing page photograph for this one is uh, a very dramatic, very dramatic waterfall. It looks to be absolutely huge cascading down. Um, which I think is um, an image of force without anger. Thank you for sharing that. I was actually going to message David and say, Madeline's really upset with you because you always read her favorite version. So she's messaging me about that. Um, <laughs> I am not upset yeah, with him. Yeah. I feel guilty because I'm reading his favorite version. No, 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 no. I was, I was waiting for Madeline to, to put an exclamation point that I was just going to read the old one. She didn't say anything. I said, okay, okay I'll read. <laughs> the this is I, what I was, my uh, Dow looks like. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. No, 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 you read it. No, you read it. No, you read it. No, you read it. I, I was I was really thinking about making that joke like since the minute you said it, I was going to read the Geo Fang and I was just like should I say that you're really stepping on Madeline's toes and that she's messaging me about this which she's not I'm just I was going to throw it out there but anyway um uh with that Laura did uh you find a verse that you would like to share with the group uh that does, would require you to take off the mute button you're on mute. Laura. I'm gonna ask you to unmute. Laura. Laura. I guess I'm muted. Oh, there you go. Idea. There you go. This is by Brian Brown. Oh, I thought you were reading it. That's why I was <laughs> no, anyway. A good general doesn't show off his power. A good warrior doesn't get angry. A good conqueror doesn't attack people. The good employer puts himself below employ his employees. This is called the power of non-contention. This is called using the strength of others. This is called the perfect emulation of heaven. Okay, and now I, just a little story. Well, we're going to hold off on okay. wait to comment. Wait, wait, wait for comments. Uh, okay. We're going to let uh, we're going to let um, uh, Aman share his.
translation and um oh if his, only it were mine I, you know i was i was just about to correct myself <laughs> you and jason's translation uh oh you could take it credit though, tonight everyone <laughs> actually see my screen yes excellent <clears throat> chapter 68 not vying the good officers are not militaristic the good warriors don't get angry the good conquerors are not engaged in wars the good managers stay in low positions this is the virtue of not buying this is the power of managing people this is the ultimate of complying with heaven this is a really short chapter but there's a couple of things i want to draw attention to again still addressing this word jiang as far as vying being the appropriate word contending it's that one that is not fighting or quarreling but it's not just friendly competition it's somewhere in between um <clears throat> this word will looks and sounds like that word that we were discussing in the previous chapter war however the previous one meant i this one actually has two radicals to it and i can't well maybe i can blow this up haha -ha, there we go Very good. so this first part of the radical down here actually is the character for stop the second part this big swoop that you saw in the word i is again that halberd or pole arm but it stands for all things militaristic or all things warlike so the actual word for militant military conflict is <clears throat> to stop conflict that is the goal of engaging in a militaristic or or some sort of warfare um so i offered the word militaristic as sort of a neat translation between the two but i think there's a very different connotation to the chinese character wu um <clears throat> excuse me the second one here where it says the good warrior the good warriors don't get angry this is the character for anger and i find it interesting that it's a two-part character the radical on top means slave and the bottom character means heart so to get angry is to be a slave to one's heart and lastly the thing i want to point out is that here's a military illusion here's a military illusion here's a military illusion and then here is managing people which it's very it's fascinating that it goes from warfare 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 general affairs mm. and you see it again warfare 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 general affairs jason uses the word manage um to translate this it literally translates to something more like use people but that has such negative associations in you know western culture that if we say use people we understand it to be manipulative and you know self indulgent and and deceitful where it doesn't have any of those com connotations in chinese it really means more something like you know management but again you have these militaristic illusions and then this idea of managing where this gets back to that petty individual who sees all engagement all interpersonal actions as militaristic or cast through the lens of warfare and again lao tzu's advice the virtue 
the virtue here, this virtue is not vying. This is how you actually manage people through not treating them all like they are your subordinates in military rank. And doing so will be the ultimate in complying with the model of heaven. So that's that. Yeah, you know, I find it really quickly, if I could ask the 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 uh, quick question is the sure. slave to the heart. Mm. Um, that's interesting when you're talking about anger. Uh, so is it the idea that you're indulging in your emotions, that you're embracing like your your that that your negative emotions in certain cases? Uh, I'll put that, those in the chat here. What uh, what are those top two characters that mean slave? So the word is actually Girl, new. Yeah. Go ahead, Kevin. Yeah, love the party is a girl. Uh, the next is a you again, or also. Uh, this word, uh, I'm not sure that time. Basically, if you got the first time, the first wife of the man, the code wife, the second one, could the chair, another word. You also get the like, um, for the lady part, even they call them Sao, they call it Nujia. Basically, it's that's like uh, the lady, uh, the uh, married one, a uh, married uh, lady call themselves Nu. Basically, you say under this is uh, like a more cultural practice. Everybody trying to put the you are on, you are up above me, Nujia. That's that's a practice. He, I was a slave. That, that's good. I, uh, you know, that's good to put a slave, but not really slave. But it, yeah, it, it, it's it's hard to understand. Basically, if you put a, for that angry, um, you can think about a heart. When you angry, it is you are slave of your heart because you like indulge your heart, you make your emotional, not as real you. I'm going to put on a chat too. Yeah, Please. I do have to say that it's probably the most eloquent pictorial depiction of hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. Interesting. Um, yeah. that's <laughs> but great. that's that's not necessarily what they were getting at with the same with their interpretations. Um, it was a very misogynistic time and culture and there's no denying that male chauvinism was the rule of the day um but there there isn't the same sort of association with the word like slave that we would have in modern culture because something like chattel slavery had not existed in China. It was a lowly position to be in, but it wasn't a caste that was your lot in life forever necessarily. Thank you for that, Amon. And uh, thank you, Kevin, as well. Um, so. Uh, with that, um, we have. It's heading again. Oh, did oh. you did you put your? Is that yeah your, yeah? Another I, one? I would follow up. You know, Joe's. Uh, I know. So if we, we have still have chapter left. I would say every chapter. Please, you know, I am now so only Madeline and uh, Aman, you know, and myself very interested. Also, uh, words. It's so beautiful. Each word you see is from up anger. That speak to you, I believe. Is that right? How was anger? Slave of heart. That's how the word come from. If you, you can go going deeper, even how how that word initially come from, it's very interesting. From the heart, it think about the heart. You see, that's three three a dot on the top. Then the heart. If you use our fist, the heart like a fist. It's like three. It's very interesting. Um, a second point. I'm going to since already. Uh, 
here I'm going to, you know, come this chapter is short, it's beautiful. Yeah. I would put all the, you know, military or president office, please put it on your, you know, poster. Even, by the way, I'm going to mention that we talk about the art of war in Chinese, Songzi Bingfa. The first thing, the similar concept, it's the uh, Gong Xing Wei Sa, the best. It's hard. You see, Gong is like uh, uh, invade your heart, it's uh, uh, conquer your heart, but it's win your heart. It's the best. You kind of think when the modern days, diplomatic way solve the problem. That's the first. Last, last, going to war. I suggest who going to call that uh, war. Put your finger out, use one knife. How much you can do with your little finger? Then you ask your soldiers, your friends, your people to uh, uh, fight for the war. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, great comments. Uh, so next up we have Madeline and I want to give Laura uh, her chance to to make her comments as well. Well, uh, it seems as if the character for anger um, certainly has connotations of vying, of uh, the different wives jockeying for position, uh, which is something I've certainly read about in uh, narratives of ancient China. Uh, and I was, I was actually wondering about um, uh, the good manager put, putting themselves in a low position. It reminded me of the basin of water flowing into something that's down low. Um, not necessarily the basin flooding, but of um, kind of a yin image of the valley. And, uh, you know, when I look at this, um, it, I don't know what the what the characters say, but it seems like there is a lot of um, contrasting uh, hardness, soldier, fighter, winner, manager, uh, with their opposites. So it might be kind of a yang and yin pairing in those lines. <clears throat> Interesting, actually, Aman, uh, would you like to comment on that briefly? this this actually i think she hit a nail very clearly on the head um there is a lot of and it's funny this chapter is not not conflicting not contending not you know vying and so you see characters like sha benevolent with bu not, which is a very negative. And then, you know, something like, war, you know, war, anger, um, battle that you can, I can actually look at this and see the very simple characters combined with the very complex characters, the very young characters, counterposed to the very yin characters, there is something very beautiful in this single you know poem this very short very terse poem because it actually reiterates ironically one of the lessons kevin was mentioning the art of war one of the lessons in the art of war is the greatest military victory is to avoid military conflict that right. that's one of the key lessons is that anytime it can be avoided that is the best victory of all. Um, oh, yeah. This is the ultimatum of complying with heaven. Sorry, I just read a typo there. I, I do believe that should be the ultimate in complying with heaven. But um, yeah, I, I think that this is trying to sort of synthesize and sum up all the lessons of the Dao De Ching into much more cliff notes that mm -hmm. somebody can walk away with and say, okay, if I learn nothing else, I should learn, you know, chapters 60 through 81, because all the lessons that I need are meant to, are there. 
Um, as far as that image of the basin and taking the low position, this ironically reminds me of a discussion of a good Taoist at a party. A good Taoist at a party engage, encounters a braggart, someone who we've all met, who's done the best thing, gone to the best concert, taken the best vacation, you know, seen the world, done all these things. And the immediate impulse of many people is to say, oh, yeah, I did that too. Or, oh, and you start immediately contending for that one-upsmanship. Mm. That is a very natural thing that is impulsive to all of us. I think I actually experienced this the other day when somebody was showing off a tattoo and I was like, oh, I want to show off my tattoo. And in reflection later, I was like, well, that was really egocentric and not necessary. Let them have their moment in the sun. The better thing to do, the not vying thing to do would been not to try and show off my own tattoo because that's what we are doing now but really engage in this person's artwork and say, that's incredible. That is really cool. Let Tell me about your artist. Tell me about your inspiration. Be genuinely interested, compassionate with the person. And then you diffuse the very di dynamic of contending, of competing, of vying. Um, so it's something Those that- are better. Uh, I like to say if they have more hours than I do, I don't get to call it cute, but I won't call it better or worse. <laughs> and he did. He had more hours than I did. Um, but yeah, it's not something we all get right, but it's something we all should work harder at. Well, I'm going to actually thank you for bringing him humility. Um, so, uh, no, in, in all seriousness, I think that there is this idea of one-upmanship that we all get caught up in, and at uh, one point or another, and that in retrospect, we tend to look back and say, did I really need to say that? Um, can I let somebody have their moment in the sun? Uh, and that 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 is a very wise lesson that I'm sure that we've all been in. But I really I really liked your comment, Madeline, um, about how the yin and yang are incorporated into these words, and it is a very short, as Amon had said, but very powerful verse uh, overall. And even looking at it from militist mili milita militaristic to anger to wars. Um, and seeing how it all flows to one another. It's, 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 it really is uh, much deeper than I initially thought of. And I'm just reading Jason's version right now. So uh, anyway, uh, that's enough from me. Uh, Laura, you're next, followed by Katie. Get the mute, Laura. This muting thing, it should go off automatically. Um, we have to say today in our news every minute, we hear exactly this about diplomacy because we hear about Biden talking about diplomacy is better than, you know, having war. And we're looking at Russia and the United States in this game, very much playing it. You know, diplomacy now coming into effect because now Putin is backing off uh, and they are talking. Okay, so that's yeah. one thing. All right. Okay. Yep. Okay. Um, the other thing is, I want to bring when we were talking about too much generosity. I think my daughter, um, in her first, second grade class, to the effect is they've kids have been out of school for like two years, and she's, I think, finding the effect of too much generosity. These kids are really lazy now because I think they're, they've been home, you know, what? being home, being, you know, schooled, whatever, what? by parents and stuff. And oh. they're being handed everything, you know, because the parents are there and they're getting everything they want through the generosity of their parents. And I think the effect is that they're getting, the kids now want to get everything handed to them. They, they oh, have okay. interest. So, being, yeah, that was number 67. So That was 67. We'll, I said yeah, that so, was yeah, so. So that so, yeah. is my little tale of too much generosity. There's okay. Too much generosity. 
and you know on these on these second graders after two years of not you know when they were being home at school okay thank you laura thank you okay. so next up we have um katie yeah laura i agree with you on overindulgence but I think that I've definitely happens if there's ever something that I'm like, why don't I know how to do that? It's because someone did that for me and I don't know how to do it for myself. Um, the, going to the, this chapter, um, I think the Taoist boss would be a flexible boss. So it'd be like if you're, you know, in this Taoist vision, you know, he comes to your desk, he or she comes to your desk and gives you instructions or what to do, but the, the door is open for if you have questions too, like the not Taoist boss, you know, that would be the fire hose boss that just gives, gives orders. So I think it, I think, um, uh, Margarita said it really well about like the mixing and mingling leader, like a, kind of, a, I think the way how she said it was how I liked it, that there's like some flexibility and that might be like depending on what the circumstances are like it might look different in different uh, situations but uh, it's a flexible a flexible boss not just somebody that you can't you know ask questions or you don't influence the ideas thank you so much uh katie douglas I think it's very easy. They're very soft, very, you know, um, uh, easy, you know, um, uh, soft. Um, how do you explain it? You know, very uh, manuable, you know, uh, they uh, they bend with the wind. They uh, float with the wind, you know, type of thing. So it's like um, uh, they're ready all the time, pretty much. Uh, and, um, and their uh, easiness is what I like about them. They're easy and they're uh, uh, very soft and they're very um, manuable. Okay. Thank you for your comments, Douglas. Uh, next up, we have Madeline, followed by Penny. This one, all, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, this one also reminds me of the one about um, trying to be uh, the kind of follower that you would want to have if you were the leader. Mm. And um, so if you are a military commander, <clears throat> you don't want angry soldiers. You know, you want, you want disciplined soldiers. And um, if you are an employer or a manager of people, you don't want people who are always trying to put themselves first. So it sounds a lot like uh, the teaching from that um, that verse that we had gone over fairly recently. Um, yeah, about trying to be uh, the kind of person, the kind of, the kind of underling who you would like to have if you were the person who was in charge. I, I really like that analysis as well. Um, that's another great point, Madeline, uh, how the inverse has to be true. You know, where the it's true that you, each person is playing a role in this, you know, the manager is playing their role and the person in the lower position is playing their role. And you don't want both of them trying to play each other's role. Um, and, and so that, uh, and it's, you know, it seems to me as kind of obvious as well is that, yes, you, if you're, uh, if you're an officer or a warrior, you don't want a bunch of angry people that are underneath you uh, because then actually they lose their ability to think rationally. Um, and that's as true for a manager as it is for any, it's universal actually. Anger is um, as seen as something that is uh, really takes us out of our um, our our ability to reason correctly. Um, and it's, uh, it, it's in, in, in Stoic philosophy, it's seen as to be so, so something that should be avoided at all costs. Uh, so um, that, that actually really hit, 
hit home with me personally obvious, for obvious reasons. Um, so next up, we have uh, Penny followed by Evanique. And Aman, I know you have had a really long day, so don't feel badly about ditching us at any point. Um, hey, know. if we're the only host, I'm sticking it through to at least another 14 minutes. Well, thank you. That, you know, I, I pr you know what? Thank you. Thank you. That, that's the, that's see, that's the, that's the, uh, the leader that you want <laughs> and that you'd be willing to work for. And I'm sure your students appreciate it too. Anyway, go ahead, Penny. I'll leave it. There. Okay. Yeah. I was just going to, to go back from what Amon had actually said about 67 and how, you know, there's this, it continues here, or maybe I, I guess actually Joe had said that too from the our Ursula Le Guin comments, mm -hmm. because, because, you know, basically here's rules about the type person that the leader should be too, you know, like and as in the warring period, since there was so much war, then I guess there's an emphasis on that. But then just generally, you know, he shouldn't be violent. He, he shouldn't be angry. He shouldn't be vengeful. He should be humble. And th those are the characteristics that are going to make him successful and to, to make him a successful leader who's able to really lead people. And so, you know, when they're talking to the young princelings, these are probably, I would think, some characteristics that they might tend to think would be good. You know, like, oh, I'm going to be the greatest, you know, I'm going to be violent and, you know, I'm going to make everybody really suffer and know what a wonderful person I am. And, you know, he's actually saying, no, it's the opposite. You know, if you want to be a great leader, great military person, it's the opposite. You shouldn't be violent, angry, vengeful, humble is what you should be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, and it, there's something even about a soldier being competitive if you think about that 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 comp, comp you know a, a soldier being competitive you're constantly one-upping the person that you're, you're you know you're in war with and if you think about that that's extremely dangerous because it makes it cyclical it kind of like never ends at that point if you're constantly trying to one-up the person that you're actually fighting about as opposed to send you know showing mercy and compassion and this does go back into 67 uh, mm -hmm. a little bit as well but you do see the crossover between these two um uh you know you know one of the uh i i'm gonna go ahead and read it because i i looked it up as soon as i it, there's this not so well known shakespeare play titus andronicus uh and um and one of the great lines in there is sweet mercy is nobility's true badge of courage and uh and it, it reminded me of this of actually 67 um that uh when it, the idea of um uh how to you know when you're showing compassion what is really courageous anyway i had to add that in there i, I really was i love that line so anyway thank you for indulging my uh ego there for a minute um Evanique. Yeah, I I was thinking of this thing like with anger and um like it not being the best emotion. But when I think of anger sometimes, and I do agree, like sometimes it could go off the rails, but so can love. So when I think of sometimes anger, I think of righteous anger and I think of the civil rights movement where people got angry by treated being treated as less than uh second class citizens and it's because of that what some people will call righteous anger that got people to move and to have the civil rights movement happen and there were various leaders with various different styles of leadership that actually were effective when they came together they were effective in causing change in in this country and so i, I wonder if you know anger is all bad. Um, and I was thinking too, um, just another point is that like we talk about love and love is great. 
however, you can act irrationally loving someone too, just like you can act irrationally being anger. I think the key is the control part, right? Is controlling that anger and what you do with it because it's, anger itself is an emotion. It's what you do with it that makes the difference, I think. So those were just my thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I'll just make a really brief comment, but because I know Aman wants to speak here. So um, it's, I think that it, that anger, there's, you know, two parts to it, but it's you're trying to replace it with something that allows you to act rationally so that it's spurring you into, uh, into uh, a wise action as opposed to an emotion where you're just reacting to the situation and not necessarily thinking strategically or logically. Uh, so it's just, it's not necessarily kind of suppressing the emotion, it's more replacing it. Um, and it, it's, it, so there, is, there are forms of anger, and I wouldn't call that anger, though, because anger, I look at personally, is something that takes you away from uh, your rational being and actually kind of, um, and uh, kind of, um, uh, you know, you're acting instinctually, not necessarily consciously or thoughtfully. So that's, it's a minor distinction, but anyway, uh, Aman, please. Um, actually, I going to agree with Ebonique on this wholeheartedly. I just finished a very long lecture series on the passions, mm -hmm. the things that were the bane of all philosophy for hundreds of years now. And going all the way back, you went back to Marcus Aurelius. So yeah. go back a little further to Aristotle in okay. the Nicomonian Ethics. He talks about anger as a virtue in the right measure under the right circumstances utilize the right way and he actually talks about the fact that it would be that not only is it appropriate but obligatory that one does have correct anger under the correct circumstances in the correct measure i think emotional intelligence gets a little short shrift. And it's one of the things that I think, Ebony, your comment teased out very well and is sort of a second tier lesson within the Tao Te Ching, the idea that there are not absolute dichotomies. Anger is not bad, compassion is not good, but the good warrior doesn't get angry and just leave it at that. They temper that anger, they, they tint that anger with the compassion that they've already cultivated, the love that they've already learned to cultivate so that their anger is there to be utilized in the right way so that you can go and march for your civil rights or feminists can go and say, yeah, we've been oppressed for the last couple thousand years and we're angry about it and we're tired of it and this is not going to stand any longer. So there is a healthy expression of any emotion. I liked Jason's translation in that he said a good warrior doesn't get angry. And it's that active verb get that is almost evocative of the idea of this to the exclusion of anything else, that this becomes wholly and completely what is my motivation. I need to remember that emotions are complex. They are never as simple as I am just angry because I can be angry and I can at the same time be ashamed of my anger because I shouldn't be angry at this. And that makes my anger have a different coloration. And, and there's social context as well, because emotions aren't something, they're not episodic. They don't just happen to you. They have a social context that can make them enduring. And we've heard, we've talked about people who we would call angry people, or we've talked about people who we would call compassionate people. That's not an episode that's brief and fleeting. It's a characteristic that is in endemic to their person. And I think that is really the second tier lesson here that 
this is not your motivation indefinitely. This is not to be your defining characteristic as you go forth to be a warrior. You may need it on the battlefield, but it needs to be well-tempered with the sort of person that you have cultivated in advance. And that should be a person who embraces those three virtues discussed in the last chapter more than the virtues of anger, assertion, aggressive, young characteristics. So yeah, I, I think that's very a, a very astute observation. I got about two minutes before I, I am done for the evening. I thank you all, and I'm going to stick around to listen, but if I disappear, my salutations and thanks, and uh, hopefully Jason does a better job of sharing his own work next week. Oh, you know, you did a fabulous job, and you always do each week, and it's an honor to have you here. Um, it really is. Just I have a really quick question. Yeah, is Aristotle's, when he talks about anger, is it like, is it uh, like a golden mean that he's trying yeah. to? Okay. It, it goes back to all of his golden means that these things done in the right measure in the right way okay. with the right object are appropriate and signs of a healthy mind. Um, the notion of excising the passions really comes about more with um, St. Augustine, where right. he starts his meditation talking about how these things have ruled him and they need to be excised. And then that moves into sort of the Christendom ethic of anger is always bad. And culturally in, you know, medieval Europe, anger was always considered a vice. Um, it was in fact, Pope Gregory's, you know, penultimate deadly sin right up there with envy. We've only sort of become lukewarm with the notion that anger isn't always in and of itself a bad thing in a modern world because we've actually seen applications of it with things like civil rights, the women's rights, uh, gay activist rights, the Indian rights in India against the British, where anger was justified understandable, but utilized under that temper of extreme understanding for what was the greater virtue that we're working towards. And uh, in all those cases, it was some sort of compassionate inclusion of people into society as opposed to an exclusionary sort of means. And that is one of the key characteristics of most anger is that it is exclusionary in that you find someone or something as an object of offense and you elect that you make the judgment that they deserve punishment and that's not what you're after i think with this chapter it's saying don't do that thank you bon um yeah no and i think we're actually uh um I think we're closer on this uh, th be with the the stoic approach, which is just this uh, replacing of the emotion, not suppressing. That's a very important point. Um, the idea that if you would be suppressing an emotion, like that all anger is bad and that it needs to be uh, exorcised from you know uh, from your from your very being, is actually that's proven to be uh, very harmful because you're suppressing. Uh, your emotions, which is unhealthy, but it's not. Yeah, I think I, I think we're pretty close on it. Um, so next up, I have uh, Laura, and then good night to Aman, uh, who had just left. Laura, uh, you're on mute again. Um, I was just remembering reading when I was reading Sullivan, how he was talking about anger and trees and the, the roots of the trees being really important because the anger could go in the begin in there and sort of wet work, work, walk its way up into the tree so that it, the, the anger had a lot of time before, you know, and to, to progress in, you know, 
and work its way through, if I remember correctly, that the tree served a really important role in terms of a person um, uh, letting go of its anger and the anger being able to, you know, he could go back to the anger at various times and see if the person was still so angry or not, you know, if it, if it had managed to dissipate, you know, as it crawled up in, in the tree, through the tree. And I may have made all that up, but I seem to remember that. Well, it's still very poetic. So I think it's actually a good place to, to end our evening. So. Oh, I'm um, glad I was able to do that for you, Joe. Oh, you know, you can send me a bill later. Um, so. Well, you can send me the check later. What do you think? Oh, yeah. <laughs> um, I'll send a donation. How's that? So. Um, Here's the check, Joe. <laughs> Uh, with that, I'm just going to make some uh, brief announcements for everybody, and I want to thank everybody for coming this evening. Uh, it was it's wonderful to have all of you. Um, uh, is Brian okay, Penny? Just checking. Um, he's okay, but he's like totally worn out. So he he got the computer out like at five thirty, and he was going to be ready to go, and then he's like. I'm tired. So he's sleeping. <laughs> that's a, that's a, that's right. Just tell me he's always missed. He's always missed. But and anyway, and thank you for coming. Thank you for yeah, coming. That's yeah. okay. Thank you. Did Brian get COVID? Yeah, he just yeah. got over it. Oh dear. Yeah. I think he'll be tired for a long time, from what I understand of people who have. Uh, yeah. yeah. So, anyway, so I'm gonna make some announcements uh, and. Uh, about upcoming events. And so tomorrow night, we have a really interesting comprehensivist Wednesdays. It's in conjunction with the Philadelphia Thinking Society. Uh, and it's tools for comprehensivity, ambiguity, contradiction, and paradox, how mathematic, uh, mathematicians think. I have the book. I have not read it. Um, I've read excerpts of it. It's, uh, it's really interesting. I would highly encourage you to read um, uh, CJ's essay uh, for that event. Um, it's it's. I think it's really going to be an interesting event. There's 35 people show, uh, signed up um, on on one website. I don't know how many are signed up on uh, on the Greater Philadelphia Thinking Society's website, but I really do think that that's going to be interesting. And um, and I know Laura as a mathematician, I, I I would think you would enjoy that. Um, so, uh, and anybody else, uh, you know, I really highly encourage you to, uh, attend that one because I, it's, it's going to be more on a philosophical level, uh, and scientific level than it is, in, as, you know, it's not going to get into the hardcore mathematics. I, at least I hope not. Um, anyway, uh, and so Thursday we have the evolving self by, uh, Mihai Chiksi Zent Mihai, if I'm saying that correctly. Uh, Who Controls the Mind, Chapter 2, and that's at 7 o'clock, um, and that is being led by Maritza, and uh, so that'll be at 7 o'clock on Thursday, uh, followed by the conversations on the Gospel of John, and that will be, I believe, Chapter 11. Um, just a, an announcement that this will be the last Gospel of John that we'll be having, I believe. Starting next week, we'll be starting a new series, a self-improvement series. Actually, we'll be bringing it back, a self-improvement series. And uh, the first session is actually going to be led by the person who has led all the discussions on self-improvement in the past. Uh, his name is John, and it's excellent. So uh, I really think it's it's, it's really going to be interesting uh, to attend that. And so that's, that's going to be, um, we, we kicked it off last night. And I think that there, that that's really going to be a lot, it's going to be highly interactive. So uh, I highly encourage everybody to attend. Um, and so, and Friday evening, it'll be the Bhagavad Gita. Uh, and uh, we'll be covering chapter six, verses 20 through 247. And um, as, as far as this weekend is concerned, we have the Fountainhead, 
uh, by Ayn Rand, and that'll be on part two, chapter six through 14. Wow, that, that's a lot of chapters. Um, and that's uh, that'll be uh, Saturday at two o'clock. I don't see Jason's um, Jason's event posted yet, but he he will be having a seven o'clock. Uh, and I, 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 Madeline, maybe you could help me out. Do you know what it's on? Yes, um, I know he lists it through his World Philosophy Meetup group as well as through Fifty Two Living Ideas. And uh, it's on Asian philosophy. It's on Saturdays at seven o'clock Eastern time. And it's, I, I'd imagine it's gonna stay at seven. He's back in the States now. That's why he couldn't join us uh, this evening, but I'd imagine it's gonna stay at seven. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, I believe so. Okay. All right, so, uh, and then on Sunday we have um, Dostoevsky's The Possessed for which I have a lot of reading to do. Uh, so um, anyway, uh, this weekend, but I, I intend to get it done. Uh, so I'm really actually looking forward to that. And hopefully I'll see a few of you there. I know I'll see Madeline. So thank you everyone. Uh, everyone have a wonderful evening. I really appreciate you staying and uh, joining me this evening as always. And um, hopefully we'll see you next week. Thank you, Joe. Take care. Or if not, thanks, Joe. Thank you. Bye, Joe. Bye. <laughs>